Welcome to Sherlock Mondays, everyone. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we are going on a biblioventure through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. This is episode 18, The Adventure of the Cardboard Box, and joining me as co-host is Curtis Armstrong. Hey, Curtis. Hey there. How are you, Ed? It, I'm great, and it's great to see you. Um a a deceptively simple title that will you know that but there's gruesome stuff inside the box so definitely what is inside the box and i recently saw you at uh, the baker street irregulars weekend and uh um more on that in a moment um the curtis is here because curtis is here to help me on Sherlock Mondays to deduce, decipher, and dissect Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson, in a kind of conversational annotation. If you are watching live right now, I would ask you to, well, have fun in the live chat, which is always a lot of fun, but if you're, but I would also ask you to uh, like and subscribe to this channel. Um, Sherlock Mondays is also an audio podcast. So if you're listening uh, to the audio version, thank you for listening. Any new viewers, you can watch the backlog of these or you can just read the story that we're doing for this week. And that's all you need to do. If you register at the Rosenbach's website at rosenbach.org, I will send you an email every week that gives you a link to the PDF of the story for the week as it was originally published in the Strand Magazine. And I also send our cocktail recipes. Mm. Which, and, and what I am drinking tonight, Curtis, is it's called Sarah's Reward, which is a grim name oh, oh. that Mary Alcaro came up with. And it's uh, it's navy strength rum and grapefruit juice, little soda water in there, little club soda. There's the salted rim on the glass, and it's uh, it's two grapefruit slices for the ears. So there oh, we go. Oh my goodness, Mary, you are the best. Yeah, the, uh, I, they. I'm always amazed with what she comes up with. She does some a uh, great uh, drinks that. That is uh, really good. Um, so I saw you at BSI. Uh, I swear, a few things, uh, Curtis. Always fun. You go up there frequently, don't you, to New York for the Baker Street Regulars weekend? Well, I live here now. So That's right. So it's a lot easier than it it's used a lot to easier be. than it used to be. Cross the country before to be at the at the BSI weekends, but uh, last year actually was my first year as a native New Yorker. Not that I'm a native New Yorker. That is um, resident um, New Yorker. There so you go. Uh, it was a lot easier and uh, fun as always. I mean, it's the greatest group of people in the world, and we all love Sherlock Holmes, and um, it's marvelous. Everybody is so welcoming, so many great conversations, not just about Sherlock, but about people's lives. Everything. And Everything. Uh, I mean, that's the, the wonderful thing about them is everyone is extremely well-versed in the canon and Sherlock Holmes, but they also have all of these other interests, which are, you learn new things about people every year. Um, it's, it's really delightful. And you got to, you, you, you got to speak at the BSI dinner as well, didn't you? I did. I did a, 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 a little paper at the, at the dinner itself. And uh, it was a lot of fun and an honor extraordinary honor. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Baker Street Irregulars is an organization that I first found out about when I was still in high school. And um, from that time, I wanted to be a member of the Baker Street Irregulars. The idea that I would become a Baker Street Irregular was, seemed impossible. The idea that I would be actually writing a paper and delivering it at the dinner, I would never have imagined. But it was it was great fun and a great honor. What was your what was your paper about? It was called the B list. It wasn't strictly speaking a scholarly paper. It was more of a fun paper about mm. the sort of idiot 
criminals in the town, <laughs> not the brilliant, you know, genius uh, uh, criminals, but the morons who don't do very well. Jim Browner may have fallen into that list. So, well, uh, well, only to an extent, Jim Browner did because Jim. Well, we'll we'll get to Jim. We will. Um, I also got to see you do something that I know you love to do. Always dreamed of doing when you were young is play Sherlock Holmes. That's at, correct. I've at, never done it uh, until this year. It and, was the Gillette Luncheon. Right. Um, where were we at the uh, at Connolly's Pub? Yeah. And uh, and Ray Betzner, uh, the wonderful Ray Betzner, our friend who was a special guest on one show, yeah, right. And I, I was actually just reading an article that uh, he wrote for the for uh, one of the Sherlock Holmes magazines, and um, he's a dear friend and a lovely person. And he wrote a short sketch, very funny, about Sherlock Holmes and Mrs. Hudson. And Ashley Polisek and I did those parts, and uh, it it was remarkably silly, but nice. great fun. and a lot of fun. And Ken Ludwig played the bust. Ken was the dummy. The dummy. Uh, <laughs> Ken was the uh, was yes was the uh, the bust in Sherlock Holmes's uh, uh, flat. It was filmed, uh, and there is the video. Luck. <laughs> the yeah, it, it was filmed it's the video awesome. was uh posted on facebook and i put that um link in the uh chat i've heard that it's going to be on youtube and when it is i'll make sure i share that even more widely for people to watch your silliness oh as thank you fun, which was so much fun we really enjoyed it well the story that we're going to do is not silly <laughs> no um, we have shared a, a PDF facsimile of the Adventure of Cardboard Box as it was originally published in the January 1893 issue of the Strand Magazine. You can download that on the Rosenbach's Sherlock Mondays page. Um, what a great way to start the year um, <laughs> is this one, this, this rather grim story. And we'll, and we'll, uh, it opens with one of its adventure number 14. And it, and it opens with, again, with Watson talking about how he chooses his, his the cases for his memoirs. Right. Um, in choosing a few typical cases which illustrate the remarkable mental qualities of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I have endeavored as far as possible to select those which presented the minimum of sensationalism while offering a fair field for his talents. And... Um, uh, then he goes on, he says, it's impossible to entirely separate the sensational from the criminal. And, and, uh, but, but Watson doesn't want to leave out because he doesn't want to leave out essential details of these cases. Um, but apparently this time he's just going to give us the unvarnished, unvarnished sensational story as it happened. That's right. That's right. And it's a truly grim and violent disturbing story mm -hmm. um which leads to a, a whole issue on the on the the, the public the publication of this story um initially as you say uh in the strand magazine i guess number 14 um but uh once it had appeared in the strand magazine it disappeared and when the memoirs, the collection of these stories that we're into now, uh, was published in book form, this story was missing. Yeah. Uh, but not in America in the first edition. Right. In, in right. Americans can handle it, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> I, I think it, it probably was. It's a good question is, you know, let's get to that. Let's do that question at the end. That's I really want to save that for the end after we've hit all the all the points of it, because it is a, it's 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 completely mysterious. It's just conjecture as to why he pulled it out, I think. But we'll talk about that at the end. Um it's a blazing hot day in August. This story starts. Um Baker Street was like an oven. Uh, Watson's looking out the window. We get this Baker Street view in some of the stories. I like when this comes in. It's this kind of Watson, like this is my view on the world, and then someone will come in and they'll have to 
uh, do a case. He mentions his uh, service in India had trained him to stand the heat. Um, Watson loves to remind us of his military service, which which frankly was was brief. Um, <laughs> but he's he is and it's what I find interesting about it is Doyle and his kind of especially when wars break out in England, the Boer War and then later World War One, and Doyle so much wanting to be a part of those wars and turned down for service, but he contributes in other ways. I I, I, I always get the feeling that this side of Watson definitely stands in for Doyle for himself in that he wishes, I think he wishes he had served at some. Now he did, he wasn't a, a, on a, on, on a ship. Was it uh, the whaler? Well, I guess that's not really, he wasn't on a military ship though, was he? No, I don't no, think. No, no, no. That, when he was on the ship, that wasn't military. Yeah. He was on a whaling ship. But it seems as Doyle gets older, he always, he, he wants to be more and more involved with the military and well, it's a big part of the culture. I mean, yeah. it's, I don't know that it's that much something that, he wants to do because he feels left out. Um, but it was a big part of, of British culture was the, was the military. And Dr. Watson, from the very first story, um, you're told that this is from Dr. Watson's memoirs and yeah. that he was late at the Indian Army. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't something that he just dropped in. It was part of this character. Yeah. That he uh, that, that that he brings up, um, and Doyle even went so far as to make his own uniform for World War One. Um, when they wouldn't let him be in the service, and he went over to see the troops, he designs his own uniform to wear, and and has kind of formal photographs taken in it. Of course, when he visits World War One, he's he's so disillusioned he could see the kind of war that it is, um, and uh, but Watson here is not only well and we get an and it's an early story this because they're together in baker street so this is this could be pre-marriage i mean a reminder to people who read the stories that they're not written in chronological order of Holmes and watson's life that doyle is always kind of going back and forth at different stages in their life which yeah. makes chronologists very happy um but the the other reminder here is his Watson has a depleted bank account, which is one of the reasons he needs to live with homes is he doesn't have much money. So he doesn't really have a practice going on yet. Um, and I like to mention that one of the places he would like to go and on vacation during the heat is uh, is the South Sea to go and um, relax on a shingle of South Sea. And of course, Doyle himself was uh had a, a medical practice there for right. a couple of years when he first starts out as a doctor yeah. i can't stop drinking this okay. it's really tasty <laughs> um and then um here's here's sherlock and watson sherlock loved to lie this is a great little piece about a great little thing as he says about Sherlock. He loved to lie in the very center of five millions of people with his filaments stretching out and running through them, responsive to every little rumor or suspicion of unsolved crime. Um, this is, um, it's almost as if Sherlock's the spider in a sense at the center of the web, but he's mm -hmm. trying to, you know, Catch every vibration is him then being able to go catch the criminals. Right. And they, um, and let's, let, let, me, let me share that picture of Paget here because it's another one of these, I don't know, like almost loose, relaxing pictures here. There we go. Of the two of them here in their quarters. And it's not the only time we see Sherlock in this kind of lounging mode, right? Um, lying on the divan here, 
this is when he's got the the the, the note out here, I think, from Lestrade, but the paper's on the floor. This is the bachelor life, right? Well, yeah, but it's also, it's also when you see what Watson is doing, Watson, the, the, the quote beneath the picture is, I fell into a brown study. Yes. This is the moment where Watson is thinking about, uh, he's looking at the two pictures that he has uh, uh, over his uh, bookshelf and thinking about the uh, uh, the uh, uh, he says right here Holmes says uh, that he was drawn to Watson thinking without Watson talking he yeah. was able to read his mind when Watson throws and shows in the picture there the newspaper is thrown to the ground and that's what draws Holmes to look at Watson and start to follow what his mind is thinking. And it's a very famous sequence where the mind reading sequence. And um, later when this story was, was taken out of the book form, Doyle took this uh, scene, which he knew was too good to lose. Yeah. No idea whether he was gonna keep this story or not. And put it into the resident patient. Yes, um, because he he knew this was just a wonderful, wonderful way of of showing how Holmes thought and worked, and the two of them as friends. Another also, one, yeah. The, the other part of this picture that you're pointing out, the the lounging. It's also, as you said, it's a blazing hot day. And the two of them are lying there, clearly just not moving because of the heat in Baker Street. The age of no air conditioning. So just right. when it's hot, you're just hot and you're fully dressed, yeah, collars yeah. on, yeah. buttoned up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Holmes says the uh, this uh, b before he tell before he reads his mind. Well, he, he reads his mind that he tells him. He says, "You remember that some little time ago when I read you the passage in one of Poe's sketches in which a close reasoner follows the unspoken thoughts of his companion." And this is from Study in Scarlet. And this was when Holmes explained to Watson how he knew he was from Afghanistan. And he says, uh, "In Study in Scarlet, it is simple enough as you explain it." I said, smiling. Uh, well, Watson says, you remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe. No doubt you think that you are complimenting me in comparing me to Dupin. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. That trick of his of breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an apropos remark after a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial. And that's then what Sherlock is doing right here. Well, um, not only is he doing it, he's claiming that that he has switched the entire story. And he says right here, when I read you the passage from one of Poe's sketches, close reasoner, you know, blah, blah, blah. You were inclined to treat the matter as a mere tour de force of the author. On my remarking, I was constantly in the habit of doing the same thing. You expressed incredulity. Watson then cries out, oh, no. <laughs> and if he were allowed to finish, he would probably have said, actually, it was the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> but Holmes just interrupts him and the story goes on. And one of the things that clues him in, you, you mentioned these pictures and it's a framed picture of General Gordon. Right. Uh, Chinese, Chinese Gordon. Chinese is Gordon was his nickname. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, and the other one of Henry Ward Beecher, which is really, it's an unusual pair, first of Definitely all. Definitely an unusual pair. That these would be Watson's heroes. Um, Gordon, for people who don't know, he's, he's one of those heroes of the British Empire. He defeated rebels in China. Uh, he's later killed in Khartoum by other rebels in the Sudan. You can watch the Charlton Heston movie. Um, and uh, Henry Ward Beecher is the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. But he was 
enormously famous uh, Beecher was as a lecturer, preacher, um, did a series of lectures on the Civil War in Europe to kind of not not so much get support for the Union, but to m prevent other countries from supporting the Confederacy, which, you know, and and which may be, you know, kind of how Watson or someone in, in England knows him so well, as he did a very famous tour over there lecturing on the Civil War. Um, but it's unusual. I mean, these would be, I mean, this set, this must say something about this character, Watson, that these well, are. It the does. And it's, it's peculiar because the, the other thing about, about uh, Henry Ward Beecher was he was, he was uh, anti-slavery more and more throughout his life. He was, a, he was virulently anti-slavery. He was in favor of, he was a, 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 in favor of William of women's suffrage. Uh, he was a progressive character in in at that time, and so you have these two people in you know they're Watson's pictures. So it says something. You have the military of Chinese Gordon, and then. Henry Ward Beecher. It's so peculiar and it's never commented on. Yeah. Um, but it's just, you also never really see Watson in that light before or after. It's just dropped in, presumably to just show what a genius Holmes was at, at reading his mind. These memoirs are really memoirs about Holmes, but but Watson is writing them, but he doesn't want to reveal. Doyle doesn't do much revealing of Watson at all in the stories. Yeah. It's always about Sherlock. We get little details about Sherlock along the way, but the details we get about Watson never kind of develop into any, you know, any real specifics about his character. Right. The um so he runs through this whole thing and then he says, uh, which I have to say for my money, the, the Dr. Bell trick here gets stretched a little thin. Um, the, the kind of, um, uh, he, the, this kind of train of thought that Holmes really goes through the whole, you know, steps of how he sees the one thing leads to the other. I don't know if it's first time readers will completely find this, you know, fascinating, but, or maybe, and and so maybe it's because I've read it so many times that, I, I mean, I just think of a million other ways he could have gone with it. And really? did, yeah, it just, I would, I would disagree. You, you, yeah. Okay. Uh, this seems very reasonable to you then it's the, it, it just seems thin. It's to what it is. It's, it is. it's that's you know, true. It's, it's what was, what was written. Of course, you can always say, well, he was right. So it did. Right. <laughs> That's okay. Cats are always jumping into these shows. Yes. Um, the uh, Now you're crawling on the uh, thing up behind <laughs> you there. There you go. Um, well, in any case, it's, it, it astounds Watson as usual, as it should. Um, and uh, Watson is as, as amazed as before uh, after hearing it this time. As always. Yes. Um, now Holmes asks him, uh, if about this, uh, he asks him if he's seen this little paragraph in the paper about Susan Cushing of Cross Street Croydon. And it is the story is a gruesome packet, is the headline, right? Uh, and we get the details from Sherlock, um, of the uh case here, and it is, um, what people think is a revolting practical joke is what the article says that the this small packet wrapped in brown paper handed in by the postman uh, a cardboard box filled with coarse salt and there are two human ears apparently quite freshly severed sent by parcel post from belfast um which is a a whole different you know you know you know kind of avenue he could have gone down and figuring out what this is um and uh, and Miss Cushing, who received it, is, a, is just this maiden lady of 50, led a retired life. 
she thinks maybe because she, you know, rented to young medical students once and had to kick them out that they were playing a joke on her by sending it. And of course it is, um, uh, but Holmes, uh, well, of course, there's no worry about solving the case because Mr. Lestrade, one of the very smartest of our detective officers, is in charge of the case. Um, and Holmes then says he has a note from him that he wants his involvement on it as well. Um, I have in my notes, I don't know, we have to wait for later for this. Um, um, oh, no, here it is. And he mentions here, the box is a half pound of honeydew tobacco box is this. And um, uh, did you know, where is my little thing here somewhere? Um, McClellan Tobacco once produced a honeydew tobacco, um, which a McClellan's not in existence anymore, but they also had a black shag and an Arcadia. But the fact that they chose the honeydew from this story, the box containing the human ears as the to do a uh, a tobacco, I always thought was rather odd. Like Sherlock Holmes fans would be like, really? That's the one you're going to choose? Does it taste like ears? Um, but uh, honeydew, for people that don't know, is a, um, uh, in the 19th century, some manufacturers would started calling all kind of sweetened tobacco honeydew. Um, honey was not the sweetener in it, though. It was usually molasses. Um, and a few years ago, there was a discovery in someone was renovating a house and they discovered in the wall some artifacts from the 19th century. And one of them was a honey, a box of honeydew tobacco with no tobacco in it. And it was also wrapped in twine. Let me share that uh, picture. Um, someone shared it on our Facebook group, but there's also an article, a blog post by James O'Leary on the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere site that um, with a write-up of it as well. And there it is, bright flaked honeydew. And the box is yellow, just like Holmes says in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was wrapped in twine. Uh, fortunately, when they opened it, they were not ears. There were actually coins <laughs> inside it. But um, but this must, you know, this is very tempting to think that this is the exact box that Doyle was was thinking of, that this honeydew in the yellow box, very clearly marked. Uh, it's from the right time period to uh, 1870s um, uh, at the earliest. So it really would have worked for this story. I'm fascinated if they found that. But we put the link up in there too, uh, to the IHO's post talking about all the stuff that they found in it. Um, and I can't let a tobacco smoking reference go by without talking about it, Curtis. Sorry. Um <laughs> the, um, someone asked the question are there not too many Sherlock Holmes stories that take place in summer hmm I don't know I'd really have to give well that... I mean I, I, this is the one where it makes a, an actual point of it yeah the early the beginnings of the stories often will have have descriptions of the weather it'll be snowing uh, or it'll be you know a storm rain whatever and this is, as far as I can remember, the only one where ba where he actually says Baker Street was like an oven, and it was it was horribly hot. And Holmes winds up saying to Watson, "Would you like to take a run down to Croydon and escape from the heat a little? Yeah, and, or or to South Sea, wherever it is we're going to at Croydon, and." Um, and uh, so they do, and it's sort of a relief to them, I think. It's nice, Watson, you know, that, that it, and this frequently happens too. He, he specifically asks Watson to, you know, come with him and um, Watson gets to then say yes. And it's never assumed that he'll help him or go with him on these ventures. But Watson's always, of course, overjoyed um, to go down to Croydon, which is a, uh, 
I guess you could kind of it's a it's a neighborhood. It's an area of kind of the greater London metropolitan area, uh, southeast of the center of the city. Um, they meet Lestrade there as wiry, as dapper, and as ferret like as ever. That 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 I mean, I I feel I wonder does every time we see Lestrade does the ferret come up again? It comes up in the very first in Study in Scarlet and. Watson really can't seem to get away from that description of him as ferret-like. Except when he calls him bulldog-like. Yes, does he? Is he bulldog-like or is that... Yeah, where... Which doesn't make sense because they don't look anything alike. But... No, no. <laughs> um, they get to her uh, Susan Cushing's house. Um, a, a little detail here, I because someone might not know what it is. Uh, sh she is sitting in her chair, a little placid-faced woman. She's working on an antimacassar. And uh, some people might not know what an antimacassar is. I remember them as a kid because we all, uh, my grandparents' house always had antimacassars on the back of their uh, sofas and chairs. And they're just little kind of cloth doilies, usually like finely worked. And it's to keep the, the, uh, uh, the hair oil off the furniture. Um, wow which was originally Macassar oil or was marketed that way. Macassar oil, you can find in any 19th century, you know, journal with advertisements, you'll find it. Any you'll find a Macassar oil ad. Usually for Allen's was the biggest, the biggest company doing it uh, originally made from oil from the Macassar ebony tree, but then it just became, they just called it all Macassar oil when they were using whatever for it. Um, and I think it really lasts in the 20th century because there were so many people still using hair greases, pomades up through, you know, into well into the 20th century. Um, but you don't find many anti-macassars on backs of sofas anymore. No. Well, um, she says the, she doesn't want to talk about this. The box is out in the outhouse. Um doesn't mean the outside bathroom people just the outhouse is just a shed on you know outside of the house um and uh and there's a little detail here Holmes is um she says well why do you have to ask me questions and 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 I don't know anything and and Holmes says quite so said Holmes in his soothing way and that's something we've been noticing in in each of these stories these kind of uh uh Holmes's soothing way he has with clients with Watson too frequently that often doesn't seem to be the character that people think of as Holmes. Well, Watson comments on the fact that he, he had a, a, a remarkably soothing effect on women when he wanted to. Yeah. And uh, in this case, obviously given what has happened to her, I mean, you can only imagine in this story, this, I mean, before the story begins, this elderly, quiet woman opening a box and finding two human ears in it. I mean, it's, it's really nightmarish for her. And in order for Holmes to get any kind of information that's going to help him solve this case, he needs to keep her calm. And he knows how to do that. Certainly, you know, Lestrade wouldn't. So it, it, it's a nice way of showing how Holmes was able to do that. And then they go out and look at the ear. And not only that, but we get a pageant illustration, which like surprises me in a way. I'm thinking like, I, I'm just, let's have a picture with the severed ears. Because this is not the usual kind of thing that the Strand would put in their magazine. They're very respectable kind of middle-class audience magazine. And um Here's the pic. I mean, you can't, it's not, you know, it's not a gory picture, but it is the two of them. They're the three of them, Lestrade and Holmes, sitting here looking at the ears on a little plank after they've taken them out. And I'm also struck by Holmes's summer outfit here um, with the boater hat um, and this light color that looks kind of like a linen suit. You can see it in another picture before when he's with, Miss Cushing here, um, looking very dapper, looking like he's come out of uh, Jerome Jerome's uh, Three Men in a Boat novel, um, and not well, it's a summer suit. I mean, it, it is. It's you know, uh, uh, Sydney Paget is is drawing it for 
to the story. Yeah. The the story has made such a point of the fact that it's, you know, it's so hot. Holmes is dressed accordingly. Watson suit's a little lighter, I guess, as well. But, you know, it's still... Holmes is Holmes is definitely dressed for this weather uh, right. and for, for a little visit to Croydon here. He examined them minutely. Um, they go back in and um, uh, well, now now it's Holmes examining. And this is classic Holmes observing, looking at evidence. You know, he notices the twine that it's tarred. And the knot is peculiar, so he's he's thinking sailor right away here. Um, even even down to the the pen that wrote the letter, that it was a broad pointed pen, probably a J. That's the that's the type of tip on the on the pen that did the with inferior ink. Um, it's masculine writing um, with someone with a limited education and unfamiliar with Croydon. Um, that it's rough salt used to preserve the ears means that it's almost not medical students. They wouldn't use that. Right. But all, but also the, the, he notices that these ears are freshly severed and they're, and it would, you know, from a, uh, from a blunt instrument, not a very precise, you know, medical scalpel. So Holmes says, this is not a practical joke. Right. Um, and that we now, this is a, you know, this is a very serious, you know, situation here. And for Watson, a vague thrill ran through me as I listened to my companion's words. I mean, this is, it's exciting in its gruesome way that this is, you know, uh, Watson gets to be present on one of these cases. Lestrade is like just, you know, only half convinced. He doesn't want to let go of his simple theory of it was just a practical joke um but i love that you know a vague thrill ran through me is watson's reaction to all of this um and it is a double murder then holmes figures that this is the evidence of a double murder now not necessarily it could be you know but um uh, but it is very likely that this is, uh, 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 or th this could be murder, which it turns out to be, we know. Um, and then he also notices that one ear is female and the other male. Um, and uh, and all of this kind of, you know, we, we, we've been seeing this recently in these stories. It's, it's, it's Holmes, Holmes showing his reasoning ability but I also like to think, Curtis, that this is in a way it's also these are readers are learning how to read mystery stories and learning to follow this kind of deductive reasoning, look for clues when something happens. It's kind of, you know, readers will notice things more than they used to notice things because now they're used to Holmes piecing, piecing the tale together from his observations and what he's seen. Right. Well, I mean, it's it serves lots of purposes it lays out something for watson it's showing his methods to the reader and it's also setting up something for in this case for the scotland yard detective to poo poo i mean it it's it, yeah it, all of that is part of this a key part of of the kind of uh edgar Allan poe formula for detective stories too is you have to kind of show up the, the the police force is inept and that's something that runs through sherlock stories and this one as well um but holmes also remarks that of course you know miss cushing didn't know anything doesn't know anything or doesn't know that a crime was committed because why would she have called the cops if she had known anything about this um right. so um so, but she has called the police in and then Holmes wants to go in and ask her some questions. But while he's doing it, he paused, Watson says, and I was surprised on glancing around to see that he was staring with singular intentness at the lady's profile. Surprise and satisfaction were both for an instant to be read upon his eager face, though when she glanced around to, around to find out the cause of his silence, he had become as demure as ever. And of course, Watson can see nothing that it could count for, you know, his excited 
his uh, evident excitement. But it is Holmes, of course, seeing her ears and right. like, okay, and now I've seen your I've I've seen your ear severed is what he's thinking because it's a similar ear. And then he asks her about the portraits around the place. He gets to play that kind of Dr. Bell trick with her in a sense that, oh, you have sisters. She's like, how do you know? Well, I've seen the portraits here and then they're all around. Um, they, um, but this is also the way, I, I love this dialogue here because it's the way he's kind of pulling information out of her slowly, like he did in the sign of four with Mordecai Smith's wife about the boat, right? He knows just the right question to ask so she won't shut up and not tell him. Right. Um, especially when they get to the boat later, he says, oh, that was the conqueror. And she's like, oh no, it was the May Day. And, you know, so he, he's able to get information from her without seeming like he's really grilling her. Um, turns out she has uh, two sisters. Uh, one of them, the youngest one married uh, the sailor, Jim Browner, who has also had trouble with alcohol. Um, and a little drink would send him stark staring mad. And, um, and then she has another sister, Sarah, who had a temper uh sarah's sarah's temper she says um and uh who lived with her for a little bit but now is gone she also lived with them and and everything's you know that but now everybody's on their own um home, that's it home's to solve the case right like now at this point he's already gotten everything that he needs to know to figure it out and now the reader's just along the ride with watson to watch it all play out um Holmes sends off a wire to find out if the Browners are home. Then, you know, uh, well, he doesn't say that, but he sends off a short wire. Well, that's what we'll find out later that that's that this is the moment in the story where he's finding out if they're home and he goes to visit the other sister and she doesn't see them. She's ill, he's told. And Holmes just says, I did not wish to tell her anything. I only wanted to look at her. Um, uh, it's uh, it. Uh, not the only story that Holmes solves very quickly. This happens in uh, in our last story too, Silver Blaze. He solves it, you know, as soon as he looks at the evidence, and well, it takes one walk, and then he looks at the at the pockets of of uh, um, of the trainer of Straker, and then he's figured it out. And now he's just kind of teasing everyone all along to wait for him to reveal what the what the solution is. Well, it's the it's what makes these stories so magnificent. The way the 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 they're structured, that we are the ones who have to keep up with him. He's already there, but he never lets us know that. Mm -hmm. Watson, we you know we wait until he's ready to reveal. And but for now, Holmes just says, uh, "Let's have a lunch break," uh, which they do. And um, while while they have their lunch break, let me take this moment to take a little break and uh, thank all of you for watching this episode and to let you know that as a nonprofit organization, the Rosenbach Museum and Library depends on the generation on the generosity of friends and supporters like you to keep programs like this free and accessible to hundreds of fellow Sherlockians worldwide. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenback and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do at our website, or you could become a member. Uh, membership gives you free museum admission, but also discounts on programs and courses, exclusive invitations to member-only events. You can learn more about how to become a member on our website. Uh, part of our membership is early access to program and course registration. We have a few we have several in-person and uh, uh, online programs and courses coming up for the winter, uh, including an online course on Dracula that I'm going to be uh, teaching that will start very soon. It is just about full. I think there's three spots left in it. Um, uh, a Ulysses course, a weekly course on James Joyce Ulysses, uh, a Virginia Woolf course that is also just about full. I think there's two spots left in that. And a, and, a, and a Robert Burns online course, which I'm very excited. Um, uh, we just celebrated uh, Burns Night at the Rosenbach a few days ago. Curtis, you ever celebrate Burns Night, Robert Burns' birthday? I did, yes. Yes, it's wonderful. 
we had a haggis, we had music, uh, singing, you know, Burns uh, songs and poems. We have a, a, a phenomenal uh, Robert Burns collection at the Rosenbach, uh, manuscripts and books that uh, first editions, but books that Burns owned, um, several of them. He, he's not just signed them to friends, but he writes a poem in them and then presented the books to them. So we have this really great Burns collection at the Rosenbach that we're able to share in this online course. And for people that live in the Philadelphia area, we're also having a one day seminar course too, that people can come and, and uh, revel in Burns. So um, something I highly recommend. It's a really great experience. Uh, don't be afraid of 18th century Scots dialect poetry because they are a lot of fun and really enjoyable to read. So um, lots of great stuff. Uh, check us out online. And that's all we have for today. Um, Holmes and Watson have a little meal together and we get more music, which I love the music details in these uh, stories. This is, again, this is a case that do we ever learn the kind of music that Watson likes? Um, but we certainly get lots of instances of, of Holmes's musical tastes. And here he's talking about nothing but violins and he's recently bought a Stradivarius and then he's talking about Paganini and um, just small little details. But Holmes is always ready to relax and enjoy himself, especially over music. Well, and they and Watson mentions the fact that they sat for over an hour over a bottle of claret. Yeah. Uh, while Holmes told one story after another about Paganini. And I, it just is amazing to think that he he knew that many, that he was actually able to, over an hour, tell one story after another. All, it, while, it, all while they're waiting for this case to resolve, for this murder to be caught. Like Holmes has sent the information and, you know, is, you know, have to, he finally gets a telegram from Lestrade, uh, or no, they go to the police station and Lestrade's there. And this exchange is fabulous, right? Lestrade was waiting for us at the door. A telegram for you, Mr. Holmes. Holmes has the telegram sent to the police for himself. And Holmes says, uh, ha, it, was the, it is the answer. Um, and then he looks at it and crumbles it, puts it in his pocket. And Lestrade says, well, have you found out anything? Oh, I've found out everything. Yeah. What? You're joking. <laughs> I was never more serious in my life. A shocking crime has been committed, and I think that I have now laid bare every detail of it. And the criminal? Holmes scribbled a few words upon the back of one of his visiting cards and threw it over to Lestrade um, and tells him that he can't effect an arrest until tomorrow night, but don't mention my name at all in connection with the case as I choose to be associated only with those crimes which present some difficulty in their solution. And then they walk away. It's like mic drop. I'm done. And Holmes walks away from Lestrade. Yep. <laughs> or Lestrade. Well, although Strat is delighted, he says he's Lestrade was still staring with a delighted face at the card, which Holmes well, he's delighted because he's caught the criminal, and also he doesn't have to give Holmes credit because Holmes, <laughs> Holmes is like, oh. yeah, don't tell anybody he I wins. solved it. <laughs> um. So now it's back to the uh, Baker Street um, for um, cigars. Uh, I was going to smoke a cigar tonight, but I thought I'd just stay with the pipe. Because um, we get two mentions, because Holmes packs a cigar case earlier. Now they're chatting over cigars. It's not going to get to smoke the pipe in this story. Uh, as I've mentioned before to people, that he smokes, he smokes all tobaccos all throughout these stories, um, not just pipes. And never the giant, you know uh pipe that is usually associated with them um name drops of story study and scarlet and sign of four get mentioned um frequent still frequent still happening in in many stories i had a little um uh where's my spreadsheet for all of the stories um i've been tracking these kind of story elements that happen frequently and 
previous cases getting mentioned so far, it's more than half. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight of the 14 stories, Holmes mentions other cases they've been, or Watson mentioned, Watson or Holmes mentions other cases they have been on. Um, again, creating this deep kind of, a deeper history for what is still fairly new for some of these readers. Um, but what he says about it is that uh, we have been compelled, like those cases, we have been compelled to reason backwards from effects to causes. And that's how he has solved these that. Um, uh, and that's, it's, I mean, that's the, that's the way all his reasoning goes. I mean, that's his definition of, deduction in these stories mm -hmm. um, is to kind of you know reason backward from effects to causes it's what's fascinating to me curtis too is that it's all that's how mystery writers frequently write construct their stories is yeah. that they have, and that's how we know doyle did that you have to write them backwards right in order to make all the pieces fit and poe did this too and there's a letter from charles dickens to poe about how he tells him that Charles Brockton Brown, now William Godwin wrote wrote the uh, the eighteenth century Gothic novel Caleb Williams backwards in order to make it all fit together. A time when writers or authors were figuring out how to do this thing, and this is how mystery writers do it. But this is what Holmes has to do too. Um, and then he goes on, and we get more of this, you know. Holmes's, uh, uh, you know, theory here, his theories of, of how to solve cases. Um, oh, here's where, this is where he calls him a bulldog, uh, Lestrade, right? Although he is absolutely devoid of reason, he is tenacious as a bulldog. Um, and um, Holmes tells Watson that, well, the case is complete, except for some details. You have, of course, formed your own conclusions, Watson hasn't formed any conclusions. Right. <laughs> he never does. Uh, no, thank you. I haven't, you know, but this is the device to get home to then explain everything. Exactly. Um, uh, how to solve a, this is how to solve a case, according to Sherlock Holmes. The first, start with no theory. Um, he says, uh, um, approach it with an absolutely blank mind. Um, we have formed no theories. So no, don't go in with the theory. Um, otherwise it'll be, you know, you'll, you'll find the reasons that fit your theory instead of the other way around. Although Holmes does this in a way he's test, he's constantly testing hypotheses. Um, and then he says, um, uh, observe and draw inferences. Um, that's all you do. And that's all he did in this case. And he says, as soon as he, you know, looked at the evidence, he was able to figure out that, um, uh, that it was a sailor, that, that that it was addressed to Miss S. Cushing. And so two of the sisters' names start with S. You know, the address, by the story he gets, the quarrel in the family. It was posted from Belfast. So again, he's thinking more sailor. And then Holmes also mentions that he has even written in last year's anthropological journal, you will find two short monographs from my pen upon the subject of ears. <laughs> One of his many monographs. And Curtis, I, I, was, I, I was looking in the last clinger in the annotations. Apparently, the Strand Magazine published two anonymous pieces on ears later this year. Well, I think it's actually uh, the is it the strand or I think what 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 Les Klinger says here is properly it was the Journal of the Anthropo Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, the Journal of the Society, which was formed in 1871, and so that was where this the uh, this uh, article appeared but there were there literally were two articles on here oh yeah in yeah. the strand which yeah. i which i i i found fascinating i'll and i'll i'll share the image he I'll, was a reader he wasn't just writing for them he read them too and here they are uh this is this it was a called a chapter on ears and there's no author for it 
and it is um uh you can see they've you know describing the the, the, the parts of the ear here and then it's pictures of famous people's ears yeah. uh, here's dickens's ear um john stuart mills cardinal newman's here's mozart's ear and a normal ear and so you know you can draw your inferences as to how mozart could hear music better um but it's fascinating that there was here it is and you know january this year holmes is telling holmes is saying in a story that He's written a couple monographs on ears and later in the year, two articles appear in the strand. I wonder if someone even got the idea of that from reading this story. It wouldn't surprise me. Ah, Sarah's reward. That's so grim that Mary named the string Sarah's reward as well. Um, they, um, they get a note from Lestrade. And um, uh, I'm, I mean, anything about the, I mean, here, you know, her address. I mean, it just he goes through the whole. It's it's a long explanation of how he has solved the case. Her address had, you know, uh, the the one sister had been living with her, so that's why she's gotten the package, and she thought it was it was meant for the other one. Um, and uh, Holmes then gets a um, uh, home the telegram that he sent is to find out if the Browners were at home and and but Browner had departed and then they get the the uh, the package a bulky envelope they get at Baker Street from Lestrade which begins with in accordance with the scheme which we had formed in order to test our theater theories and Holmes right away says the we is rather fine Watson is it not um, that you know they have Lestrade is of course taken the well Holmes said I'm not taking any credit so you know um Lestrade says they've arrested uh Jim Browner and um and he came quietly enough and Lestrade's note finishes the affair proves as I always thought it would to be an extremely simple one but I am obliged to you for assisting me in my investigation um uh every every you know it, it, that's always the case in these stories. I don't know if does Lestrade ever really properly thank Sherlock um, and give him credit. Yeah, he does. <laughs> There's one. Well, not Lestrade. I think it's Stanley Hopkins in one yeah. of his stories says at the at the you know the, this brilliant solution to the crime. If you came down to Scotland Yard, everyone there would be proud yeah. to shake your hand. Shake your hand. But, yeah. Lestrade, maybe not so much. <laughs> well, that's the Sherlock story. It's over. But no, now we get we get Jim Browner's confession, which is included in this, you know, the package that Lestrade has sent over. And then the story really gets even more fascinating. Um, I think this is a, a, a very well-constructed Sherlock story for the mystery showing us that whole process right this is this is why we read mystery stories like this because it's all about the process that the detective goes through it's not necessarily the solution it's not necessarily the crime it's the way the the detective solves it and holmes has been through all this and now doyle gives us something else and in the i mean it's in, in a small form he's done this in in other stories too, when we get a longer confession or it winds up being the story is about someone telling a story in a sense, but this one, we get everything. We get all the Holmes investigation stuff. I think, and especially of um, engineer's thumb where Holmes doesn't really do anything. It's basically someone telling a story and Holmes is there at the beginning at the end, but we get a really interesting story in the middle, but here we get the whole investigation and now Browner's story, which is even grimmer than just two ears in a box. Um, and it begin once you read the opening uh, the opening of this from Browner, have I anything to say? This opening paragraph is just chilling. He says, uh... Um, 
Exatamente. Uh... Shortly after G. Lestrade, he's got his little letter there. And then it starts, have I anything to say? Yeah. Um... Yeah. Um... Yeah, he says, uh, have I anything to say? Yes, I have a deal to say. I have to make a clean breast of it all. You can hang me or you can leave me alone. I don't care what, I don't care a plug what you do. I tell you I've not shut an eye in sleep since I did it, and I don't believe I ever will again until I get past all waking. Sometimes it's his face, but most generally it's hers. I'm never without one or the other before me, which is sort of, that goes back a little bit to to studying Scarlet. Yeah. Jefferson Hope is talking about how he would see the face of his wife and her father floating ahead of him. Uh, it, it, this is very interesting. And he says, he looks, he looks frowning in black light, but she has a kind of surprise upon her face. I, the white lamb, she might well be surprised when she read death on a face that had seldom looked anything but love upon her before. It's really amazing. This whole story, and I, I was struck as I was reading it for, for, for this, again, is uh, usually I think you get to a point in a Sherlock Holmes story where it's the end and you're expecting it to end. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, this story which goes on for a bit, but it's so tightly written and so dark and so violent that, I, and it brings to you, yes, you knew that the, people had been murdered and there was a man and a woman in the ears and all of those kinds of things. But when you have the murderer describing it to you, it's, it is one of the reasons you sort of assume why this story wound up disappearing for a while. It's almost too much. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Engineer's Thumb, uh, which is another story where somebody gets Part of their body hacked off mm -hmm. um but of course in engineer's thumb he survives he's able to tell the story these two people didn't make it yeah and it's truly horrible and he's so haunted by it so it's not even a yeah <laughs> yeah it's not even that kind of story where you feel like oh we've caught the bad guy and you know he's he's wanted to be caught and he is deeply you know ashamed remorse and deep guilt over the whole thing so it's it kind of takes away the almost the glee in catching the killer right they're like oh we've caught him because what good is, like what good is it he's going to be hung they're dead there's nothing to be gained by any of this um i mean obviously the killer's caught he's not going to murder anybody again but it almost, it almost seems as if he would he would have been giving himself up before long anyway. Maybe, but he doesn't do it. They come and pick him up both. He has not turned himself in. I mean, who knows whether he would have or not. And we get this fascinating story from him about <clears throat> how he had um he says, I was blue ribbon at the time, which is a temperance badge that he had been, you know, he had quit drinking, he knew it was an issue. But then, you know, later after his sister-in-law, Sarah, who was a fine, tall woman, black and quick and fierce with a proud way of carrying her head and a glint from her eye like the spark from a flint. Um, that's the sister that is going to, you know, fall in love with him or at least want him to fall in love with her. And when he doesn't, she kind of goads her sister into you know having an affair with someone else and then he starts drinking and everything you know gets worse from there on but it's a 
it's a it's a rough story and one of those you know kind of almost anti temperance or one of those temperance tales one of those you know anti alcohol tales we see from the 19th century i think really influences this well i think also he's i mean doyle did say that uh, to at some point that one of the reasons for for withholding this from book from a book collection was because it dealt with a with a an affair, um, but when you see the say way, that, I believe so that it was it was it, he didn't put it he didn't say that it was an affair, but it seemed like the only real explanation for it would have been because of that. When you read this, I was just looking at it right here. Uh, when he comes home, he's telling the story about when Sarah was living with them. Yeah. He comes home and uh, he's waiting for his wife to come up, come home and she's not there. And he's impatient and pacing up and down. And Sarah says, can't you be happy for five minutes without Mary, Jim? It's a bad compliment to me that you can't be contented with my society for so short a time. He says, that's all right, my lass said I, putting my hand towards her in a kindly way, but she had it in both of hers in an instant, and they burned as if they were in a fever. I looked into her eyes and read it all there. There was no need for her to speak, nor for me either. I frowned and drew my hand away. Yeah. I mean, it's really strong and very, feels almost contemporary in mm -hmm. the, the sexual element to this story i've i've seen this in in noir movies i've seen this scene played yeah. out you but, know you know at the time it's yeah it's a, it's a remarkable thing to write and rather than rewrite it make it in some way less explicit he just got he just got rid of the story altogether and then clearly his wife then seems to be having an affair with Alec Fairbairn. Like he goes away on the ship and she's immediately, you know, in a house alone with, 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 uh, with Fairbairn. Um, and uh, just, you know, unusual for the time. Well, I mean, it's unusual for Doyle. I mean, it's not unusual for a lot of fiction that's happening then, but I'm not sure the Strand magazine generally goes in for stories like this. Well, um, they didn't. They didn't. They they didn't have a problem pu publishing. Yeah. Place. I think this was Doyle's problem. Yeah. Not the Strand magazines and yeah. not the people who were, who were putting out the book uh, or collections. I think this was strictly Doyle. We even get an illustration of the um, of the murder as it because as it. Again, I, I mean, it's very violent, and I, I mean, of all of the the uh, pageant of any of the illustrations, maybe the most violent. Uh, yeah, I I don't recall. I here here it is. I don't recall. I mean, I have to really look through it. I don't recall another scene of a murder like this where you're actually watching it occur. Um, I mean, it's just before he strikes him, but. The two of them in the boat and his face there um looking a bit She's, you know reaching out to protect yeah alex fair uh, alec fairbairn which is yeah. what, what puts the tin hat on it for uh for browning so yeah and so grim the kind of aftermath i tied the bodies into the boat stove a plank and stood by until they had sunk yeah. um you know, before that, the cutting off of the ears, um, very, very kind of matter of fact language and the kind of language that reminds me very much of Poe. Um, I cut up the body and, you know, collected all the blood and buried them under the boards. Like uh, it doesn't know. it doesn't remind me of Poe at all, because well, I, I, I I think that that he's got us. There is a, a deep guilt and sensitivity to yes. this, this character that that I don't associate with Paul. No, no, that 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 attitude of the killer is not the same as Poe, but the 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 kind of matter-of-fact way of dealing with the actual crime and the way he describes it 
Mm-hmm. Poe does that. And Poe people, people think Poe's stories are often like really gross and grim. And actually they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're just very, that kind of, you know, and then I caught up the body and I mean, which is horrific in its way, but it's done in such a simplistic way. Um, and he goes through that bit here too, where he's just, you know, uh, that, which is it's, but it's the aftermath before that it's all the passion, all the, you know, um, uh, his, you know, my God, shall I ever forget their faces and, and all of that. He's very passionate about that. And he's also very remorseful. Um, and post killers tend not to be remorseful. Um, this agony of guilt that he that he goes through um uh he, he finishes it um there you have the whole truth of it you can hang me or do what you like with me but you cannot punish me as i have been punished already i cannot shut my eyes but i see those two faces staring at me um uh and then he even says like you won't put me alone into a cell sir for pity's sake don't um that you know he's he's t- He's terrified himself at the end, which is a form of justice for the reader, for 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 someone you know uh, at the time looking at this. And but it's it, there's no there's no feeling of resolution at the end of this. And what does Holmes say at the end here? What is the meaning of it, Watson? said Holmes solemnly as he laid down the paper. What object is served by this circle of misery? and violence and fear it must tend to some end or else our universe is ruled by chance which is unthinkable but what end there is the great standing perennial problem to which human reason is as far from an answer as ever um really a perfect story i think it's just remarkable in that last speech of holmes's it's one of the things that we love about him is that out of this, you know, mystery story comes this philosophical yearning to find out why this is what he does. This is what Holmes's job is, but he still doesn't understand. We've had him that kind of thing could happen. Yeah, we've had him comment on crime, on criminals, on evil, and but that phrase there that kind of he's trying to reconcile evil in the world and in a providential world like where's providence where is you know what good can come of 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 any of these kinds of things happening and this is the trade that he has set himself up in um i so doyle doesn't so it's published in the strand and then at the end of this year, Doyle will publish his other collect, just like he did with the adventures. He took the first 12, published them in a book, and then he sets these to be published. And then he pulls cardboard box. So then it winds up being just 11 stories, but only in the British edition, only in the British first edition. The American first edition has the cardboard box, but I think later American editions don't have the cardboard box. So that might mean that. It was. It went, and then when Doyle realized that he had it pulled, but I don't believe we have, you know, documentation him saying, you know, this or him giving reasons why he kept it out. And there's all. I mean, there's always conjecture, especially in the biographies, as to um, why he would do this. Is it? Is it just because of this? Because of the content? Because it's it's such a grim story. Is it because it deals with um, uh, adultery? Um, is you know, is this something he doesn't want people talking about in you know, uh, or associating himself with uh, as an author? Um, it's interesting that Henry Ward Beecher gets mentioned in the story, and Henry Ward Beecher is involved in a, in a because he's so famous in a big you know, case where he is because he apparently was sleeping with a lot of women along the way in his career. And some of them were married and one husband finally take them, takes them to court over it. Um, and that was a big trial in the, in the late 19th century. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't know why Doyle admits it. It's, is it, 
do you, do you think it's just the sheer bleakness of it? I think it's the violence and the adultery. I mean, it's just, it goes beyond what he did at any other time that he was writing these stories. He didn't, he didn't go this far. And I think that as, and it's a beautifully written yeah. story. And obviously years later, he rethought it and wound up publishing it anyway. Yeah. Um, but it's in a later collection, his last that, collection. That was, that was, that was after the turn of the century. Yeah. Um, before, you know, the new century would come, as Watson says somewhere, uh, before the true story can be told. Hmm. And that's what, that's what happened with this story. Good. Maybe that's a good way of summing it up. Well, it winds up being a short show for us tonight doing this. I mean, there's, you know, it's, uh, we, 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 we've, we've hit what there is in it and yep. uh, it is, but that's the, that's the takeaway is that it is, it's bleakness and uh, it's, it's a story for, for Doyle, at least it should have been written later. It should have been for a, another age. Well, Sherlockians. Thank you for joining us for episode 18 of Sherlock Mondays. Curtis, thank you. Thank you very glad, much. I'm glad you got to do this story with me. I I, I appreciate your take on it a lot. Um, you will return shortly. You will be in here for episode 20, The Stockbroker's Clerk. That's the, Or The Stockbroker's Clark, I should say, since it's a British story. Um on our next show, episode 19, our mixologist Mary El Caro will join us, which I always love to talk about a weird story in which a distraught husband comes to homes for marriage advice. <laughs> and what on earth is this yellow face he's seeing in the window of a neighboring cottage? Um, that'll be a real interesting one to talk about with Mary. Thank you to our chat, Mrs. Hudson, Brianna, for managing the live chat links. Thank you to our sponsor of Sherlock Mondays, Lisa Washington. We couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. You can support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also care for our collections. You could also become a member. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. You can find out more at our website, rosenback.org again let me remind you to subscribe to our channel like these videos if you're listening to the podcast leave us a review curtis thank you thanks very much Ed. i will see you again in the near future everyone i am edward g pettit of the rosenback museum and library where the game is a book thanks so much bye-bye